Well, if you're a guest here with us this morning, you might be really confused about what's happening. The service is a little different than uh, many of our others. Uh, You're not always handed a palm branch and encouraged to shout in services on Sunday, right? That only happens about, you know, once a year. This is it. So enjoy it. You know, today we're going to talk about what it really means for us to do this, what we just did as we prepare for Easter. Because it can feel kind of uh, weird, right? Especially if you've never experienced a Palm Sunday service before. Sometimes we don't know why it is that we do some of the things that we're doing in church. And so today I want to talk a little bit about that. In our Mark 11, 1 through 11 text, we see Jesus entering Jerusalem. He's coming from Jericho. Now, if you remember, we are doing a little bit of a rewind here, right? So if you remember back to Mark 10, when Jesus was in Jericho, he was teaching uh, multitudes of people and he was healing. He healed a blind man named Bartimaeus and the crowds were amazed. And so many of the people that were there in Jericho are likely people who are here now in the crowd at Jerusalem because Jericho was one of the places that people would often and go through on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So do you think that the Jewish people, whenever somebody, you know, popular came into town, greeted them with palm branches and shouted Hosanna? No, no, probably not. So what's special about this? They had to do this on purpose. They had to make an extra effort to do this. And, you know, I think that when we think about that, We have to wonder, we have to consider how the Jews responded to warriors and kings who had met their expectations long before Jesus. And to better understand that, we're going to go back 1,500 years before Jesus' time and look at chapter 23 of the book of Leviticus. Now, in this chapter, we read about the feasts that God had planned for his people to celebrate as spiritual practices throughout the year. And around verse 33... Uh, of Leviticus, uh, we hear about the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, as it's sometimes called. And this feast is still celebrated in many Jewish communities. And during this feast, people will build huts, temporary, uh, small temporary dwelling places. And they will live in those huts for eight days. And they do that to remember the time when they wandered in the wilderness homeless and lived in huts like the ones that they build during this festival. And throughout these eight days, the Jewish people will recite Psalms 113 through Psalms 118, because these Psalms talk about how God cared for them and how God cares for us. We uh, read in the first service part of Psalm 118. It's actually part of what we say when we do our Hosanna call to worship, and I'm going to read a little bit of that for you now. In Psalm 118, the psalmist cries out. And the psalmist says, I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So, At verse 25, the psalmist cries out, save us or deliver us, O God. And the Hebrew word for that is Hosanna. The last day of the Feast of Tabernacles is called the Great Hosanna. And the people remember that God was with them even when they wandered in the desert and that God will save them. And to celebrate that, they put together three branches. They put together a palm branch at the center with willow branches and olive branches. And they wave these three branches together. But they don't do it just in any way. What they do is they wave it front to back. Can you wave your palm branches front to back? And then left to right. And they wave it this way because they remember God's protection for them from north to south and east to west. And they wave it that way as a commitment to trust in God to be their king in every direction of their life and to deliver them from all their surrounding enemies. You can stop waving them. I know it's a lot of fun, but... 
You know, that was the start of this practice 1,500 years before Jesus, and it's something that we still do today. Isn't that incredible? Now, about 160 years before Jesus, a foreign king named Antiochus Epiphany from Syria came to Jerusalem to conquer the Holy Land. And he wanted the Jews to give up their beliefs and their traditions and their customs, and he wanted them to adopt what he felt were the far superior Greek customs. And so the Jewish people, of course, rebelled against this. So Antiochus and his troops occupied Jerusalem by force, and they took over the temple, and they sacrificed a pig on the altar, and they sacrificed it to Zeus. Now, this was an ultimate act of humiliation for the Jewish people, and it, is also, it was also the tipping point that caused the revolt of the Maccabees. So a guy named Judah Maccabee led this revolt, and it's actually where the Jewish people get Hanukkah, but that's a totally different story. So they led this revolt, and the Maccabees were successful in driving out and, and, uh, and oh, I just said his name, Antiochus, thank you, uh, And when Judah came back to Jerusalem, the people had not celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles for years. For years they had been under the oppression of Antiochus. So when Judah entered Jerusalem, how do you think they greeted him? You know what they did? They got their palm branches and their willow branches and their olive branches, and they greeted him north to south and east to west, and saying, save us, deliver us, O God. And they did it again 25 years later when Judah's brother Simon led another revolt to further cleanse the Holy Land of uh, Antiochus' oppression. You know, I'm not just giving you a history lesson here today. I'm not telling you this so that you can win when you play Jeopardy at your next dinner party, okay? I'm telling you this because it's so important to not just gloss over the expectations of the Jewish people. Many times on Palm Sunday we say, the Jewish people expected a warrior king and Jesus wasn't going to do that, and so they got mad and that's why they crucified him. But that does not get at the heart and the depth of the profound despair of the Jewish people and their desire for greatness and their desire for glory, their desire for renewal. You have to understand their history as a people who had been historically oppressed to understand their profound desperation the moment that Jesus began to enter Jerusalem. These people were currently, not only had they been historically oppressed, but they were currently under the oppression of the Roman government. And as they worshipped their one true God, as they expressed fidelity to the one true God, the Roman government saw nothing but threats against their way of life, and intolerance against the worship of their many gods. Yes, they were looking for a king, a very particular kind of king, a king who would turn the tables, who would teach the Romans a lesson, a king who would save them and free them from their oppression, all of which they could only see happening in one way because it had only happened in that one way in their entire history. And that was the way of the sword. And Jesus was not going that way. That is not what Jesus brought with him. Jesus comes fulfilling something the prophet Zechariah taught in Zechariah 9.9. He foretold it 550 years earlier when he wrote, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And he will proclaim peace to the nations, not war. Jesus comes as the Prince of Peace, which is, of course, entirely consistent with his teachings. Love your enemies, Jesus says. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone, like a Roman guard, forces you to walk a mile with them, go too. Whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
This is the peace that Jesus brought. And the great irony here is that the peace Jesus brings, the peace that is rejected by the people, is the only peace that would have saved them from their worst fears. Mark, as we've talked about throughout this series, doesn't give a lot of extra details in his narrative, right? That's one of the things that we've learned about the uh, style that Mark writes in. But when we read about Jesus' triumphant entry in Luke, Luke tells us that Jesus wept over the city. And Jesus said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This prophecy Jesus made would be fulfilled just about 40 years later when the Romans sacked Jerusalem, when they killed over a million men, women, and children who were hiding in the city walls, and when they literally tore buildings down stone by stone and uprooted the foundations. And Jesus wept, knowing that their choice to pursue their own way their own glory, instead of pursuing Jesus' way, was going to cause this, this pain and despair. You did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. The Jewish people were so wrapped up in their own idea of how things should happen, of how Jesus should behave, of what he ought to do, of what they ought to do, that they could not let go of their expectations for God's greater plan. They wanted the joy and the victory, and they sure wanted the glory, but not if it would require humility and hardship and pain. And it would. You know, it's so easy to talk about those people, isn't it? But what about us? What about you? Are you able to recognize the time of God's coming to you? This season of Lent is a time of of self-examination. When we're asked to engage this question with a sense of urgency and a desire for transformation, a new desire, and it's easy to recognize God in joy, but it's much harder to do so in hardship and sorrow. Will we set aside our own agenda and preferences in order to enter the dark places that feel empty and lifeless and forsaken, the places that Jesus traveled on his way to the cross and ultimately the resurrection, the places that Jesus traveled through on his way of peace in order to bring us new life. Are we willing to go to those places? And are we willing to search and recognize God's coming to us there. Many people will move straight from today to Easter Sunday, eager for the joy and the celebration of next Sunday. But I want to encourage you to journey with Jesus throughout the entire week ahead. And that might be different for some of you. Some of you might not have ever done this before. And this is a place where you can do that, where you can make that journey for the very first time. You know, there are several ways that you can start to engage in your spiritual formation with God throughout this week. Some of you have uh, been observing Lent for the whole season, but if you haven't, you can start now. One of those, one of the things that I love to encourage people to do in uh, their own time at home, is to read through the stories in all four Gospels of Jesus' last week. That's a great uh, practice to do this week. But then we also have an opportunity on Thursday for all of us to come together 
to uh, remember the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples. And during that time at at 6 p.m., we're going to have a meal together, but we're also going to hear about what Jesus teaches us about what it means to be a servant before he enacts that for us. And then I also want to invite you to come on Good Friday. That's the very next Friday, this Friday. And any time between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m., you can come and you can walk something that's new for us. We're setting up something called the Stations of the Cross. And it's a way that you can uh, walk from each experience that Jesus had on the road to crucifixion and read scripture and meditate on God's word and pray, talk with God about what difference it makes in your life that Jesus walked that road and walked his way to the cross. So I want to invite you to take time to come and think about that and talk with God about that today, or on Friday. And you know, I hope that you won't do that out of a a sense of guilt or obligation, but because you feel the Holy Spirit calling you to a deeper and renewed sense of transformation. And this is one of the ways that he offers to meet you where you're at. You know, when we take that time, I think that God does a unique work in us in helping us understand the Jesus that the sacrifice that Jesus made so that we could be delivered from our sin, from all of the ways in which we reject God's way of peace in favor of our own way. But I also think that as we realize that, as we come face to face with our own tendency to do just that, to reject that peace, that we're also able to say in a new way, Hosanna. Not just in superficial acclaim like the people who met Jesus at the gate did, but with a real sense of our need for a Savior. We can say, Hosanna. Save us, Jesus. Save us. We need you. That is what I hope for you this holy week. And as you do that, I just know, and Pastor Aaron and I both are so convinced that you will experience Easter and what it means to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and the offer of new life in such a profound way, having gone through that week of darkness.